Hello everyone, how are we doing? Today we're going to be continuing our regional anatomy series and focusing on the elbow. In this video specifically, we'll be covering the bones that make up the elbow. And in following videos, we'll cover the muscles. Without further ado, let's get into it. So if I zoom here on the elbow, the first thing I want to talk about is the humerus. Now in previous videos, we talked about the proximal head of the humerus. Today we're going to be talking about the distal head of the humerus. Now on this side, which is the anterior side of the humerus, we can see this articulating surface here. This is made up of two condyles. A condyle is just like a round protuberance, usually at the end of bones. Now in the case of this one, this is called the capitulum, and this side here is called the trochula. Okay, so the trochula of the humerus and the capitulum of the humerus. Like many other long bones, we also have epicondyles, as we can see here, a medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle. And with most epicondyles, we also have subsequent lines. Now you can see here, this line that follows up the bone, that's called a supracondylar line because it's above the condyla. This is called the lateral supracondylar line because it's the lateral side of the body. And then we have the medial supracondylar line, which is on the medial side of the body. Now those two points will be more important when we get into muscle insertions and origins. Now if we zoom in on the cubital portion, of the elbow joint, which is this space here, we can see two fossas, two distinct fossas. Now if we zoom in on the cubital portion of the elbow, we can see these two fossas here. We'll get back to them and I'll show you why. Now moving on from the humerus, we got the radius and we've got the ulna. So the radius is most laterally and the ulna is most medially. Zooming in on that, we can see the radius has a round head and here's the neck, whereas the ulna has this crescent shaped head. Now if we bring the ulna out you can see a bit more of that round shaped head like this. Now this little notch here, this is what we call a notch, this is known as the trochlear notch because this surface here articulates with the trochlear. Now this trochlear notch helps form the humeral ulna joint which rotates during flexion. We've also got another joint present that rotates with the ulna and it's called the radial ulna joint where the radius rotates with the ulna. We can see the radial notch right here where, where it occurs. Also on the ulna is this process here which is known as the coronoid process. Now try not to get that confused with the scapula which has the coracoid process. This is a coronoid process. Additionally we've also got this large area here. This is known as the olecron. Now the olecron of the ulna plays an important purpose in stabilizing the humor ulna joint. Now going back to the full body diagram, we can see two tuberosities here. This here is called the ulnar tuberosity. It's right under the coronoid process. And then this is the radial tuberosity. Like the supracondyle lines, they're more important in terms of muscle insertion because the muscle will attach it. And we'll talk about that in the next video. Now back to these fossas that I mentioned earlier, we can see the two divots otherwise known as fossas in the humerus, one there, one there, and there's also one on the back, which is now covered by the olecron of the ulna. Now moving back to the front, the whole purpose of these fossas is that under flexion, the radial bone and the ulnar bone are going to flex back, and these two protuberances here and then the process, the cor coronoid process over here, they're going to come back and then they're going to fit into these processes. And that way it allows a more flexion of the forearm at the elbow joint. Now back to the radius. The reason why it's round like this is because we've got this radial notch over here. And that radial notch, as well as the articular surface of the radius, the proximal side of the radius, help form the radial ulnar joint. Now this radial ulnar joint is a pivot joint too. And it will rotate on an axis. Now since it rotates on its axis, we can't have a hinge joint here because hinge joints don't allow movement laterally immediately. They only allow it in flexion and extension. Whereas this will allow the radius to spin on its axis. But this is super important because when we pronate our wrists and pronate our hands, the radius will spin and it will go over the ulna as the ulna is abducted. Now what I've done is I've gone and found a photo of this, what happens when you pronate your arms. We can see the radius will go over the ulna like this. And that's why it's important that we have a pivot joint back up here. Now that summarizes all the proximal joints. We've also got one distal joint that I'd like to talk about, which is the distal radial ulnar joint, which you can see here. 
we'll get more into that next week when we do regional anatomy of the hand. Now, the last joint I want to show you is known as the interosseous joint. And this is where you have fibrous bands that go between the two arms. Now, if I increase connective layers to layer three, we can see this band here. That's the interossi that I was talking about. It holds the two ulna and the radius together and prevents them from displacing from each other, just adding a bit more stability. In addition to its stability properties, it will also act as an attachment point for some muscles that are deep inside the forearm. And my friends, that ends today's lesson. Keep in tune for our next video, which will go over regional anatomy of the elbow again, but this time we'll talk about muscles and ligaments. Let me know in the comments if you learnt anything new, or if I did anything wrong. Other than that, look out for our next video, but until then, have a good day. Similarly, if we look to the back, we've got this other fossa down here. Now this is called the olecron fossa because the olecron of the owner will fit into it. What this allows for is better flexion of the owner at the elbow joint. Now moving back to the anterior side of the model, we can see both, both models have a long shaft with only the radius attaching to the wrist joint and the ulna does not attach to the wrist joint as we can see here. We can also see the styloid processes. Styloid processes are this little protuberance here. This is the styloid process of the radius and this is the styloid process of the ulna. And they're the very laterally and the medial aspects. Now all these bones obviously form joints. So the first main joint I want to talk about is the elbow joint. And the elbow joint is actually made up of two subdivided joints. Now the first one is the humeral radial joint. The humeral radial joint is this joint that connects the capitulum to the head of the radius. Now the radial joint itself is actually a synovial pivot joint and it resembles a synovial ball and socket joint, which we saw before at the shoulder joint here. This is a synovial ball and socket because we've got the ball and then we've got the socket. It's very similar down here, as we can see, we've got the ball of the capitulum and then the socket, which is the head of the radius, but very shallow. So that makes it a synovial pivot joint and allows it to move in flexion and in extension. It also allows it to rotate, but we'll get back to that in a sec. The next part of the elbow is the surface of the trochlea rotating with the trochlear notch of the ulna. Now this makes a synovial hinge joint which allows for both flexion and extension too. Now back to the radius, the reason why it's round like this is because we've got this radial notch over here and that radial notch as well as the articular surface of the radius, the proximal side of the radius, help form the radial ulna joint. Now this radial ulna joint is a pivot joint too and it will rotate on an axis. Now, since it rotates on its axis, we can't have a hinge joint here because hinge joints don't allow movement laterally immediately. They only allow it in flexion and extension, whereas this will allow the radius to spin on its axis. This is super important because when we pronate our wrists and pronate our hands, the radius will spin and it will go over the ulna as the ulna is abducted. Now what I've done is I've gone and found a photo of this, what happens when you pronate your arms. We can see the radius will go over the ulna like this. And that's why it's important that we have a pivot joint back up here. Now that summarizes all the proximal joints of the radius and the ulna. Now the last joint I want to show you is known as the interosseous joint. And this is where you have fibrous bands that go between the two arms here. If I increase connective layers to layer three, we can see this band here, that's the interossi that I was talking about. It holds the two ulna and the radius together and prevents them from displacing from each other, just adding a bit more stability. In addition to its stability properties, it will also act as an attachment point for some muscles that are deep inside the forearm. And my friends, that ends today's lesson. Keep in tune for our next video, which will go over regional anatomy of the elbow again, but this time we'll talk about muscles and ligaments. Let me know in the comments if you learnt anything new, or if I did anything wrong. Other than that, other than that, look out for our next video, but until then, have a good day.